I should start. Oh, hello. I still haven't gotten it. I turn the silence back. But I only have two left. <laughs> it's great. And uh, I hope I'll finish that early tomorrow morning. I know it's crazy that the new one is on. I shouldn't say crazy. I know it's bad that the new one is almost due in my thing. But <laughs> I don't know why it's taking me even longer than usual this time. <laughs> uh, all right. anyway. So, I was crazy. <laughs> um, so, I'm reading the transcript, it's quite inaccurate. <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right, so, um, so, Right, the story I've been developing about him is basically that uh, the main point was about normal silence. Um, if you apply Kuhn's theory to himself, the way he again seems to at some points in this reading, you know, he would say that like. The explanation of normal science is the, is, is the paradigmatic success of this new paradigm. <laughs> and, and then the cases of extraordinary science and revolutionary science are actually, you know, like puzzles. Again, I don't even know Kuhn does keep implying that this um, framework the right way, but the, 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 the theory of scientific progress that he's developing somehow applies to what he's doing himself. And it even seems like he thinks that it applies on two different levels, that there's like a paradigm in history or philosophy, maybe three different levels, but there's a paradigm in history or philosophy of science that he's changing. But there's also a paradigm in epistemology that he feels is in crisis, but he doesn't know how to change it, something like that. So, I mean, he, the problem with all of that, again, is that it doesn't seem like it sh that these things should apply to what he's doing, because what he's doing is not science. It's not part of a mature science. So it's a little weird. I don't know how to explain that. Uh, but anyway, so getting back to this, so like whether because of paradigms or whatever, I'm claiming that normal science is the main point, and then that the descriptions of extraordinary and revolutionary science, I guess you'd say. Are, are like intended to close off uh, loopholes that seem to be left open by his treatment of normal science. Like places where it still might look like science is the kind of free rational activity that Popper says it is. So last time I mostly talked about why, you know, he says that, that this is not Right? This is not an activity where people take um, something to be a counter instance to the old paradigm theory and therefore take the old paradigm theory to be falsified. Right? Rather, it's a, a case where they're trying their hardest to use the old paradigm theory to deal with a puzzle that's resisting their. Attempts. Um, 
So they're still um, not thinking of it at all as a counter instance. Um, so, you know, in the reading for this time, it discusses now, I mean, these things somewhat go together, right? So he does not, like, it's not so clean that he only discusses one first and then the other one. But I think the reason for this time is where he says more about, like, what actually happens during and after the scientific revolution um, and what the structure of it is, as the title of the book. Um, and, you know, this is the point where you might think. Okay, now that the new paradigm is on the table, right? So that's the difference between the extraordinary and the revolutionary process. I, I mean, he doesn't make it clear exactly, like, in some sense, the revolution, the revolution is almost instantaneous, right? He says sometimes in the middle of the night, someone gets this idea. But in another sense, it takes a long time to play out, like until the point where the new paradigm is 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 now dominant, um, and only maybe a few cranks are still trying to hold on to the old one. So, um, so, but anyway, so, so exactly when this period ends is a little bit unclear. But I think it's clear that it starts when there's a new paradigm that's now. Um, uh, starting to seem like a viable alternative to the old one. So you might think at this point, with the new paradigm on the table, you can now look back and say, oh, those things that we thought were anomalies should count as counter instances to the old paradigm, right? And now we're going to, um, like, Notice that they aren't, they aren't counter instances to the new paradigm or to its theory, right? Because again, the paradigm is more than the theory, but they aren't counter instances to the new paradigm theory. So we would say um, um, at this point, we would do the kind of thing that Popper suggests we should do, right? That is, regard the old theory as falsified. And um, and notice that the new theory is not falsified by those same observations that falsify the old theory. So we prefer the new theory. Um, so, um, so Kuhn's answer to that is to say that we can't do that because the Old, the old paradigm and the new paradigm, um, there's no neutral place from which we can decide this one, which one is doing better. Um, so, um, and this is where his famous concept of incommensurability, or you say that comes in, right? I mean, like, literally, this means that the, the metaphor is, you know, this is an example of incommensurable lengths. Imagine that this is a square. <laughs> it's pretty close. And, uh, right, like, the side of the square and the diagonal of the square are incommensurable. What does that mean? Like they can't be measured together, right? So like if you have a unit that you that you use to measure the side as and it comes out as a whole number of that unit, um, the diagonal will never be a whole number of that same unit. No matter how small you make the unit, right? You can never get it. You can never find a unit that you can use to measure this and this. Um, because as we would say, the square root of two is irrational. 
right? It's like just the length of this side is one, then the length of the back and the square root of two. Um, so, uh, So like that's the metaphor, you know, I, as a metaphor, it's a little bit weird because although, so it's true that you can't say exactly how long the diagonal is in units that you can use to measure the side exactly. You can say that the diagonal is longer than the side. <laughs> hey, I mean, you can't compare them to each other. So the metaphor, I'm not sure exactly how it works out, but in any case, that, that, so the idea is that the, the old paradigm and the new paradigm, there's like no, so to speak, unit that you can use to measure both of them. So you can say which one is doing better. And, you know, so I think, so I mean, first of all, like, I think especially in the history of the analytic philosophy of science, or maybe outside of the Popper's school, at least, like, when you mention Kuhn, this is the, like, this is supposed to be the puzzle. The Kuhn, the problem, the Kuhn problem. Incommensurability across revolutions, you know. So, I mean, uh, it is important, but I think this the reason it's important for Kuhn is what I just said, right? This is why it comes in. It comes in because he's trying to explain why, even in a revolution, we don't compare the old theory to the new theory and see which one is better. Um, um, I mean, so although it does lead him to say these things, these like relativist sounding things, right? Like that the old people and the new people live in different worlds or whatever. I mean, and he's aware that that's shocking. And as I said, he he indicates that he doesn't know what to say about that exactly because he thinks that there's an old paradigm of epistemology and it's in crisis and whatever. Um, but nevertheless, I, like, I don't think that stuff is actually the main point. The main point is, again, to, to drive home that in uh, the progress of mature science, never involves the kind of rational evaluation of theories that Popper imagines. Not even here, <laughs> right? Um, okay, so, um, so there's a bunch of, like, there's various different sides to incommensurability, and I want to come back and talk about it. First of all, are there questions about what I said so far? No. Okay. So I want to come back and talk about it in detail, but um, but I also want to talk about it in the way that Kuhn actually builds up to it because it's a little bit confusing. Um, and it's a little bit confusing because um, when he first introduces this point about incommensurability, he does it as part of an argument against the cumulative theory of, or a cumulative theory of scientific progress. And um, this is basically like on page 95 through 102. Um, and, um, And that's confusing because as far as opposing the cumulative theory goes, he's on the same side with Popper. Right? That is, Kuhn and Popper both agree that in scientific change, an old theory is rejected. An old theory that conflicts with the new theory 
in some way. Whereas the, the cumulative view that he's arguing against, and this is the other confusing thing about it, he calls the view that he's arguing against logical positivism. Or sometimes he just calls it positivism, which actually is probably more accurate. But right, I mean, so logical positivism, as you know, is the school that Carnap was instrumental in founding, right? So you might you might expect some kind of criticism of Carnap's views here, um, but actually the the position that Kuhn calls logical positivist or positivist is not Carnap's position, and not the position of anyone in the general circle, I think. So that's also a little bit confusing. Um, so um, what is the view that he calls logical positivism? Um, so it's a view according to which the old theory is never shown to be wrong in scientific change. Okay, so I mean, first of all, right away, you can tell that Popper is going to agree that this is not a good account for scientific change, right? That the old theory can never be shown to be wrong. So, I mean, so this view that he's calling positivism is um, something like the view that Popper calls conventionalism. They're both ways of defending, of claiming that the, that the old theory, no matter what happens, can never be shown to be wrong. But they, nevertheless, they, they're not the same. It's not the same as what Popper calls conventionalism. This is a different way of defending the old theory. So, um, right, he describes it, this is on page 99. If Einsteinian science seems to make Newtonian dynamics wrong, that is only because some Newtonians were so incautious as to claim that Newtonian theory yielded entirely precise results or that it was valid at very high relative velocities. Right, so that, so that the argument here is that like um, Newtonian dynamics can't have been shown to be wrong because it still works now in all the cases where it ever worked. Right, that is um, all the kind of observations that Newton was trying to account for with his theory are still accounted for by his theory to the precision that he was able to measure. So where does special relativity give different results? Well, or special, or I guess, and general relativity, where do they give different results? Well, they give different results, first of all, in cases that Newton and Newtonians never observed, right? So like, you know, if you put, if you have an electron in a particle accelerator and you apply a constant force to it, um, for a while it will accelerate the way Newton says, it should accelerate. But as it gets faster and faster, something weird happens. It starts to, um, you know, like, so according to Newton, if you apply a, a constant force to a particle, its velocity will increase like this, right? But in the particle accelerator, if this is the speed of light, instead, you start to see this, right? The electron, um, even though you keep pushing it as much as you were before, it's, it stops getting faster and faster and it starts to approach the speed of light but never quite gets there, right? So, so but what the, the positives here will say is that of course, New Newton never, you know, didn't have a particle accelerator. Right. So, like, his theory couldn't have been intended or shouldn't have been intended to predict what would happen in this weird new circumstance that, that had never been seen before. 
And the other case where, um, you know, where like relativity makes different predictions from Newtonian dynamics is in the case of ordinary things, but where we measure them super, super accurately, right? So like if you have two atomic clocks and one of them is closer to the center of the earth than the other one, so like one is in orbit or one is on the surface or whatever, then they won't measure exactly the same time because you know because the earth's gravity bends space and time <laughs> so you know um however if you try to like take a, a 17th century watch and use it to measure that difference it wouldn't work right like the watches would show exactly the same because you know those watches are not accurate enough to measure this tiny difference. So um, so again, the positivists will say, well, look, like Newton's theory couldn't have been or shouldn't have been intended to predict what will happen if you measure things with this super high precision, because like Newton didn't know any results any, of any results like that. So in other words, what Newtonian mechanics really says is, um, or really should say, is that, you know, if you observe the phenomena that Newton actually observed to the precision that Newton actually observed them, this is what you'll see. Um, Newton and other Newtonians shouldn't have ever claimed more than that. So it's like, this is the real theory. But, um, and it only applies to things that Newton actually, is, you know, or Newtonians actually observed. Now, I mean, um, I guess there's stronger, there's a weaker and stronger version of this. The stronger version, which Kuhn says the positivist really should admit to, is that the theory only describes, it's not the theory only describes the type of observations that do the thing. It only, it only applies to observations that have actually been made. <laughs> right? So, um, um, but be that as it may, the point, the problem is, according to the positive, that the Newtonians added on all kinds of other stuff unsupported conjectures, hypotheses, right? Based on the idea that this theory that describes this stuff that's actually been observed should also describe all kinds of other stuff that hasn't been observed. But this part was never part of the scientific theory, strictly speaking. This part was always an irresponsible overgeneralization. And when the new theory comes along in relativity, all it does is get rid of this stuff and then add some more stuff to this box. Right? So now we have like um, the same description we had before of the old observations, it makes the same predictions about the old observations. And then we've added more stuff that makes new predictions about different observations that were never in this box, like those atomic clocks and the particle accelerator. And, and then, like, unfortunately, people being what they are, they'll probably start adding some more of that irresponsible generalization, but that's never part of the scientific theory. The scientific theory itself is always this responsible part, and that only just grows as time goes on. Yes? This is kind of like the uh, example where like there's two earths <laughs> and they <laughs> each have water but one is slightly different to water and up to a certain point like all the experiments can come out the same so are they talk are, are is the meaning of their word water the same of the planet before they you know yeah. 
somehow related to that example, but I'm not sure. How. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's definitely somehow related to that example. I mean, it's. That example is supposed to be about reference. What makes our words refer to the things that they refer to? Is something like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know exactly how to put the two together, but you're right that there's some relationship between them. Um, so, uh, right. So, anyway, um, right. So, like, this is. So, so this does save the whole theory from ever being falsified, at least in its strong form, right? In the weak form, the new theory, the old theory could be falsified by some really weird, unexpected occurrence, right? So like if we just, if, if while we say Newtonian dynamics should only have been interpreted as talking about the type of things that Newton knew about, then it could turn out that tomorrow, all of a sudden, the type of things Newton knew about start behaving differently, and apples start falling off, and whatever, right? So, um, but if but if you understand it the strong way, then you say then you're saying that like it can't possibly be shown to be wrong because all it ever made a claim about was the observations that actually have already been made. Now, I mean, so uh, like this is not Carnap's view. You can tell this is not Carnap's view because like what generated the whole problem about dispositional predicates and theoretical terms was precisely that Carnap agreed with Popper and Kuhn that scientific theories have to make claims about things that we haven't observed. <laughs> Right, so I mean that caused a problem for logical positivism, but but it caused a problem for logical positivism because they they agreed that they didn't agree with this theory. So where does Kuhn get this theory, and why is he attributed to logical positivism? I mean, and so by the way, even in the alpha, right before that thing with dispositional term, terms and whatever comes in. It's already true, and I emphasize this many times, and I emphasize it again because it's so important that the alpha system reduces every, tells you how to reduce every statement to a statement about all the experiences you will ever have. Not to a statement about only the ones you've already had. And again, that's precisely because the um, Carnap already in Alpha is thinking that we don't, you know, even if we say something really simple, like there's a table here, we're not just claiming something about what already happened, we're, we're making claims about what's going to happen later. So, um, Right, because if you know further tests can reveal that this isn't really the table. So it's only when I fictitiously you know, assume that I have all my experience that I'm ever going to have in front of us that even in the alpha Carnap claims that this reduction can work. All right, so it's not Carnap's view, it is kind of Goodman's view, I think. And that's possibly where Kuhn gets it. Um, because uh, so the alpha wasn't translated into English until 1967. Kuhn, like, I guess, didn't know German or didn't read things in German. I don't know what languages he knew actually. You would think to write about the history of science the way he does, he would have to. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> but in any case, um, uh, but Kuhn apparently did read because he cites in the book um, Goodman's structure of appearance. So, you know, and like, so we didn't read structure of appearance in this class, but you probably could recognize from fact, fiction, and forecast that, you know, these 
these claims that the theory is supposed to be making about things that we've never observed are exactly the kind of things that that Goodman calls projections. And and Goodman's project is to like explain those projection projections like like. Um, translate them into statements that use manifest predicates about things that we have observed. So, uh, so I, I think that's possibly where, so and then there's, and I think you can understand Goodman as, as saying that um, logical positivists should say this, right? Like the point of the structure of appearance was this is how Carnap should have done that. <laughs> um, So, um, so in any case, be that as it may, this, so this is a way of, of preserving the theory from ever being falsified. It's not the same as Popper's as conventionalism. I think I could make that out with the relativity example, but it might be easier to see this. So this is a simpler example. Take the theory that the planets all move around the Earth in circular orbits. So, um, I mean, that wasn't really the Ptolemaic theory. That was pre-Ptolemaic astronomy, right? Ptolemaic astronomy has its epicycles and stuff. I don't know. So, Take the theory that the planets all move around the Earth in circular orbits. So uh, when uh, observations come in that seem to falsify that, the conventionalist is going to say, well, the definition of planet is that it moves around the Earth in a circular orbit. So like, if these actually are planets, then by definition, this is a circle. <laughs> Right. And from that point of view, they can go in various different ways. Right. I mean, they can say, well, your measuring instruments must be wrong because it has to be a circle. <laughs> or rather, not wrong, but they, you know, like we have to uh, change the way we interpret what they show because by definition, this is a circle. Or they can say, you know, oh, it turns out there are no planets. But the whole, right except sort of the moon, it's close anyway, it's not really so close, right? But, um, so, um, because by definition, a planet moves in a circle around the Earth, but what, you know, but going one way or the other, the whole theory is not false. Um, so that's how the conventionalist is going to deal with it. Whereas the way the positivist is going to deal with it is by saying something like, all the old theory claimed is that up to a certain level of precision, planets are things that look like they're going in a circle around the Earth. Right? Because no one had ever like, gone off the Earth to look at it, or ever made the kind of precise measurements on the Earth that would have been necessary to show that, that they weren't really moving in circles. Um, so, like, what those pre-Ptolemaic astronomers should have said, I guess, Eudoxus, who tried to who, who tried to make this all work in circles. But anyway, what those pre-Ptolemaic astronomers sh should have said was, you know, it looks like up to a certain precision, the planets are moving in circles around the Earth, and that theory hasn't been falsified. Still works just as well as it ever did. And, you know, as Kuhn mentions, for certain purposes, we still use it. Uh, uh, right? Because it's like, it's easier. I mean, he mentions surveyors or whatever, but even like if you have a sky chart or whatever, it shows you the planets moving in the sky as if they were moving around the Earth. Even though we know they're not. <laughs> because it's, you know, it's uh, like 
it's convenient to look at it that way for certain reasons, and it's and it gives you exactly the right predictions up to a certain precision. Right? So um, um, So whereas the conventionalist says, oh, it turns out this isn't a planet, or it turns out what we thought was an ellipse is actually a circle. The positivist says, oh no, you're right. What, you, what, what we're calling a planet doesn't move in a circle around the earth, but the part of that that actually contradicts the old theory was never part of the old theory's content. All right. Um, So, like the difference between the opponents they set up has something to do with the difference between what Hopper and Kuhn are saying. They both agree that um, scientific theories have to be risky in some way, and that that's necessary for scientific progress. Um, Right, as Kuhn says, this is on page 101, is it really any wonder that the price of significant scientific advance is a commitment that runs the risk of being wrong? What page is that? That's on page 101. Right, so like that sentence could, you know, could perfectly well be dropped into pocket and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be out of place, right? So as far as that, goes, they agree, but um, um, they disagree about, um, and I guess they agree about one other thing, so let me read this sentence, this is from page 100. These prohibitions, so the prohibitions that Kuhn is talking about at this point, are the prohibition against saying anything that goes beyond your actual data. And he says, these prohibitions are logically unexceptionable. Right? So again, that sounds like that's exactly what Popper said at this point about conventionalism, right? It's logically consistent. Um, so if you if someone wants to do that, the thing that the, the conventionalist is saying you should do and wants to call it science, I can't stop them. Right? They're not going to contradict themselves. And Kuhn is saying the same thing about this positivist. It's logically unexceptionable, but the result of accepting them would be the end of the research through which science may develop further. Without commitment to a paradox, well, okay, so maybe I should say, um, yeah, that's the point at which, that's how far the agreement between property and truth goes. So the question that the, that the disagreement has to do with why a scientific theory must make projections, right? That is why it must claim something about cases that have not been observed. Um, so like, um, for Popper, the theory has to make a bold claim in order to in order to deliberately risk being wrong, right? Because then what we do with the theory is, um, I mean, we know it's past certain tests; otherwise, we wouldn't accept it. But it has to propose further tests. Otherwise, we can't use it to learn anything. Because the only way we can use it to learn anything is to test it again and again and see if it passes. And I mean, first, like, we'll really learn something when it fails, <laughs> according to Papa. Right? As long as it keeps passing, all we learn is that um, we can still keep guessing this if we want. Right? But as soon as it fails, we learn, ah, Okay, that guess was wrong. <laughs> so, um, whereas 
Um, according to Kuhn, the theory or the, the paradigm theory has to make bold claims because otherwise there will be no puzzles to work. Right, so the continuation of that quote on page 100, I mean, leaving out a little bit, but the, basically the continuation of that quote on page 100, without commitment to a paradigm, there could be no normal science. Furthermore, that commitment must extend to areas and to degrees of precision for which there is no full precedent. If it did not, the paradigm could provide no puzzles. Right, so the reason the theory has to make these bold claims is that there have to be areas where the scientists can work hard to show how right the theory is, which they know it is. <laughs> I mean, I maybe didn't say, shouldn't say to show how right the theory is, but just um, to show exactly how it's right. That's the that's the puzzle that they have to solve. I mean, like there actually there's two parts to the puzzle. One is observational and one's theoretical, basically. Right? The observational part of the puzzle is to actually observe cases that haven't been observed before. So for that, you may have to build a particle accelerator, for example. Even though it's very expensive. <laughs> Um, but the reason you're building it is because um, you want to see how the paradigm applies to new cases. And when you get new data in and you have a hard time applying the paradigm theory to them, it just means you have to work harder on understanding exactly what the paradigm theory means. So, um, um Right, so so like Popper is worried about conventionalism because conventionalism seems is is about um, saving the theoretical statements, the statements in the theory by like adjusting the application of the concepts. Um, so. I'm not going to explain this very well. Mark is only I don't understand that. But, um, I mean, you can certainly see how, in the planet case, how that's going to work out, right? That, like, um, the conventionalist is going to make the statement all planets travel in circles around the Earth remain true by um, changing which things fall under the concepts planet and circle until it's true. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I guess you could say like, this is the kind of thing that you would um, that you would worry about if you want to if what you want to make sure is 
that the theory can make claims that turn out to be false. Um, whereas positivism is um, This is the part I'm not sure I have wrote. Yeah, so I mean, I guess you could, if you focus on the concept of planet, positivism like allows you to, um, promises to allow you to keep using the old concept planet as long as you want. Um, but all you have to do is modify um, what you were saying about it. So, um, um, right, so like reinterpret what you were saying about it. So, oh yeah, I didn't mean they move in circles. I mean, they appear to move circles, right? You modify it by subjectivizing it, basically. Um, so, uh, right, so whereas for Popper, yeah, okay, I think I do understand. So for Popper in opposing conventionalism, the moral is, I must intend my statements um, in such a way that they can be shown to be false. So I must avoid these stratagems of changing the meaning of context or whatever. For Kuhn, the moral is, if I want to be a scientist, I must mean my concepts in such a way that it can turn out to be impossible to fit the world into them. Um, so, uh, I must mean by planet something that actually goes around the Earth, it's not just something that looks like it goes around the Earth. So, like for for Popper, the key cases here that you have to that he has to make sure. Like, so here's the original list of of planets: Moon, Sun. Mercury, Venus, etc. So, like, Popper is worried about making sure that you know, this is a little weird because we don't call it planet now, but I mean, I mean the new theory is going to say planets move around the sun, right? So, um, so the the new theory, like um, the the cases that Popper wants to make sure are problems for the old theory, are the Sun, Mercury, Venus, etc. Right? He wants to make sure that what the new theory says about them can't be uh, accommodated by the old theory. Whereas for Kuhn, the cases that are really important are these two cases, where like um, the old theory wanted to class these two things together with all these things and say something about them. And the new theory doesn't let you do that. There is no one box that they that all of them go into. And this is what generates that incommensurability. So, like, according to Popper and Kuhn, the, um, the, the new theory and the old theory are incompatible. They can't both be right. But according to Popper, they're, you know, at least the cases that are worth worrying about, which is these cases, the reason. The, theory, the old theory and the new theory are not compatible. Like in this case, I think Popper will say the old theory and the new theory are compatible. They both say the moon moves in a circle around. Well, 
right? So whether you call it a planet or not, Popper always says words don't matter, right? The statements matter. So Popper is going to say, you know, in this case, there's no problem. But with these, it's incompatible. And it's incompatible because one theory says P, and the other theory says not P. <laughs> And so they're they're perfectly commensurable, right? You can just compare the prediction made by one to the prediction made by the other. They can't both be true by the law of excluded middle, right? So they're they're easy to compare. You can just tally up the score. So, but um, the, the incompatibility that Kuhn is seeing, at least this is the first and simplest kind of incompatibility that Kuhn is is. Uh, introduces is that the old theory and the new theory don't use the same language. So when they argue, they're talking past each other. That is, the word planet doesn't mean the same thing for the people who accept the new theory as it meant for the people who accept the old theory. So, so, so therefore, first of all, the, the new theory doesn't contain the old theory or any part of the old theory at all, right? Because, you know, like, um, even if we take this part of the old theory, the planets appear the planets appear to move in circles around the Earth. So you might think, well, the new theory and the old theory agree about this. But Kuhn says, no, they can't agree about this because planets doesn't mean the same thing. So you can't say the same thing using the new theory, using the new paradigm as you could using the old paradigm. The conceptual boxes that things have to be stuffed into have changed. And so the reason, so according to Popper, the reason that the, this incompatibility can lead you to switch from the new theory to the old theory is that the old theory told you exactly what um, predictions to expect. They didn't happen, and the new theory tells you why they didn't. According to Kuhn, the, um, um, the reason that the, the old theory can fail and be replaced by the new theory is so like the reason it can fail is for this is the same as the reason that it was a good theory to do good paradigm theory for normal science. Namely, that it told you to stuff nature into certain conceptual boxes, but didn't tell exact tell you exactly how to stuff them in. Right? So you had to work at it. So there was a puzzle. Um, but uh, that's also why eventually you can decide, well, what? So what do you decide? The old theory didn't tell you how to do the stuffing, and it also didn't give you any particular grounds for when the stuffing has failed. All it did was say, here's the rules, stuff things into these boxes. But the old theory can fail when 
it turns out that stuffing things into those boxes has stopped being fun. <laughs> it's too hard. It's no fun anymore. Right? So like if you get a jigsaw puzzle in a box and you work on it for years and years and years, and you just can't get all the pieces to make, you know, to fit together in the way they're supposed to. You're gonna say this jigsaw puzzle is no fun. <laughs> Too hard, right? And if they all start being like that, you say, well, I, you know, or I guess maybe not if they all start being like that. If for some reason that's the jigsaw puzzle everyone is fixated on, <laughs> Then when you decide that that one's no fun, you're going to say, look, this whole jigsaw puzzle thing is no fun. Let's do something else. You know, or you may say, all right, just put that one in the closet and we'll go back to solving the whole jigsaw puzzle. Right? That's, right? That's what Kuhn says can happen if a new paradigm doesn't come along. You just put the anomaly aside for future research. But, like, but, uh, but this is something that seems plausible in the case of jigsaw puzzles, maybe, but Kuhn says it does happen in the case of scientific revolutions. Suppose someone comes along and says, you know, if instead of trying to make it like this, you try to make it like this, With a, with a rectangular hole in the middle. It turns out you can solve this puzzle. Now, like, did you solve the puzzle? Did that person tell you how to solve the old puzzle? Well, yes and no. I mean, according to the old rules of puzzle solving, this isn't a solution. The jigsaw puzzle has to fill up the whole rectangle. Right? So in that sense, they didn't tell you how to solve this puzzle. But they told you how to do something fun with the puzzle pieces that counts as solving a new kind of puzzle. <laughs> Right? And now you can look around and see, oh, are there other puzzles that can be solved as well? <laughs> so that's what the scientific revolution is like. But you can see, um, and I, I think you can start to see more clearly how serious this problem of measurability is. These people, it's not just that they use different words and, you know, like they, or that they use the word jigsaw puzzle. One of them uses it to include only things that could be solved like this, but the other one uses it to include things that could be solved like this. So that does mean that we talk and past each other, right? Like if this one says, if, if this one says my theory is better because it can solve all jigsaw puzzles. This one's going to say, well, I mean, actually, I'm already getting into the other thing. But anyway, I mean, that will mean they talk past each other, but it's deeper than that because they disagree about what counts as a solution. Right? So when this one says, my new paradigm is better because I can solve this puzzle that you can't, this one's going to say, that's not a solution. Um, right, so, you know, like this kind of incommensurability, which just has to do with drawing the line differently, you know, I mean, again, it's already pretty serious. Um, you know, that is, and for example, Kuhn uses it to argue the same thing about relativity, right? Like when relativity says, um, the velocity of the electron will increase in such and such a way. Velocity doesn't mean the same thing as it used to. 
So it can't really be compared directly to what the Newtonian dynamics predicted. Um, but still, you might think that all these people need to get a, a good argument with each other. And right, because from Popper's point of view, what they need to do is get into an argument where one can bring their evidence and the other can bring the other evidence and they can decide which one is right. But so, um, so you might think all they would need to get into a good argument with each other is a kind of translation, right? It's like, remember when you're talking to the old people and you say planet, you have to, it means, also includes the sound of the moon, right? Or remember when you're talking to the new people and you say planet, it doesn't include the sound of the moon. If they just keep that in mind, they would be able to. But but these so that's like I guess I erased, I erased the word intermeasurability. Like the first kind is just like different concepts. The second one is the different standards, methods. Right, and that's what I was like. The jigsaw puzzle example was a simple example of that, where what we count as a solution is different. So Kuhn gives examples like this from the history of science. Um, um, so, like, uh, I think the best example he has is the example of attractive and repulsive forces. So, you know, Aristotelians, at least, um, he doesn't add this, but I think maybe you should say Aristotelians post Galen. Um, uh, thought that attractive and repulsive forces were a perfectly good way of explaining things. Right, so Galen actually says, like, you know, everything has its attractive and repulsive, I guess he doesn't use, does he use the word really force? Powers, maybe? I don't remember exactly what he says, but do you know who Galen is? <laughs> Galen was kind of a founder of Western medicine. <laughs> I mean, sort of like, you know, there's Hippocrates and there's people before Galen, but uh, if Hippocrates was even a real person. But, um, but uh, yeah, Galen was, is, you know, like Galen's books continue to be used as medical textbooks throughout the Middle Ages and the early modern period. Um, he lived in, I guess, like around the first or second century AD. Um, yeah, so, but I mean, he didn't only write about medicine, he, or in connection with writing about medicine, he wrote about a lot of fundamental physical questions as well. So, um, yeah, so he actually said everything is characterized by its attractive and repulsive powers. And he lists as examples um, the magnet and amber, which in Greek was called electron, right? That is, magnetism and electricity were like, from the beginning, were two of the main examples of natural attractive and repulsive forces. So, you know. Um, so like, so in this part, if someone asks you, why does this happen, right? Like, why does a certain thing happen in the body? And you say, well, it's because, you know, the liver exerts an attractive force. Um, that's a good answer. And then in the around the 17th century, people start saying, wait, what kind of answer is that? 
Right? And this is as part of the new paradigm of 17th century mechanism, where they say, look, like um, telling me that it has an attractive or repulsive force that is referring to an occult quality of the thing is um, no explanation at all. It just says that um, it's like if I ask, why does this magnet attract iron? And you say, because it has an attractive force, <laughs> you're not telling me anything. Right? And this is the thing that Moliere from famously made fun of in the example of the uh, medical student who, you know, answer to the like test he's being given says that. Um, opium causes sleep, sleep because it has a dormant virtue, <laughs> right? So um, opium is also like an important example of Gale and medieval medicine. Although that you know that particular sentence is from Moliere. So right, so I mean, these people say, look, these kind of explanations are no good. An explanation is when you tell me what body pushed some other body. <laughs> to make this happen. That I understand, right? One body, two bodies can't be in the same place at the same time by definition of body or something like that. So if one of them moves, the other one's going to have to move. This counts as an explanation. And then, after that, <laughs> You had a new period where after like a kind of transition, this is something that Kuhn maybe doesn't account for as well as he might for he might these kind of transitions that he brings up. But after a kind of transition where like Newton himself tries to explain gravity, or at least hopes that gravitation can be explained by a mechanistic explanation. Um, People conclude that uh, no, actually, I guess like attractive forces are a good explanation, <laughs> right? And, we, and if you ask why the moon goes around the Earth and why there are tides and so on and so forth, you say because you know like all matter exerts an attractive force on other matter. But this is the law, you know, m one m two over r squared, and once that explanation is expected, accepted, people discover other ones, such as our old friends, magnetism and electricity. <laughs> so, right, like Coulomb and people like that say, hey, you know, it turns out gravity isn't the only attractive or repulsive force. There's also these electrical forces, and we can give the law, and it's also an inverse square law, and, you know, so on and so forth. So all of a sudden, like at this stage, something counted as an explanation. At this stage, the same thing didn't count as an explanation. And at this stage, it counted as an explanation again. And I think, you know, we could have added uh, Einstein on here and say, but now it doesn't count as an explanation anymore. Right? Now again, we say, although it's not, it's not a mechanism, but again, we say there's no action at a distance. I mean, all like physical causation is local. All right, but so then by that, so so the point is like so so you know yeah, you can see this is kind of like a puzzle example. Um, you know, the people from before one of these changes are going to say, well, our theory, you know, uh, gives. Well, I guess it depends which way it's going, but let's say, you know, the Newtonians are going to say our theory is better because it explains the tides, the motion of the planets, et cetera, et cetera. The old people are going to say that's not an explanation. That's exactly what Leibniz said in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, right? He says, you know, for one body to move around another in a vacuum is a miracle of the highest order. Beyond the power of any creature. <laughs> and we shouldn't resort to, to such miracles in science. 
<laughs> right? But which he means it's inconceivable, you know, why the presence of one body should affect the way another body that's not touching it moves. Um, so when you say that's why it's moving, you're not giving any explanation about it. You're appealing to a miracle. Um, so, of course, from the point of view of the new paradigm, that's wrong. The new paradigm does explain why the moon orbits around the Earth, for example. Um, but now I think you can start to see even better why you can't put these two things on the table next to each other and compare them to see which one works better than the other. Um, now, I guess, I mean, you could say in some of these cases, maybe it's not so clear in these cases I've written here, but the newton Einstein case might be clearer. You can say, you know, well, but hold on a second. It's not, they're not, I mean, the old theory failed, right? It made predictions that, that came out wrong. But the problem is that's not the way it looks like from within the old paradigm. From the end, within the old paradigm, there's some anomalies, there's some puzzles that are too hard to solve. But there always are anomalies. Right? And Kuhn says, um, like, there have to be. Scientists wouldn't be interested in a proposed theory that doesn't have any anomalies because it doesn't promise any interesting research. So, um, so, yeah, there's going to be things that, from the point of view of the new paradigm, can be pointed out as the counter instances to the old paradigm theory. But they'll never look like counter instances from the point of view of the old paradigm theory. They'll always just look like puzzles. Right? So, so this is, I mean, if this is right, and um, you know this part of it, I'm pretty sure it's right. <laughs> I've, I've just supplied things I know about Gale and alignments and whatever that Kuhn doesn't mention. Um, so uh, if if this is right, then then Kuhn is is a pretty strong case for saying that we can't simply compare the old theory to the new theory because more than the theory has changed. The concepts we use to state the theory have changed, and more importantly, like what counts as an explanation, what counts as an interesting research problem, what counts as the type of question that might be addressed in this area. Um, all those things have also changed, and so there's no um, neutral point of view that we can use to measure the two against each other. And then there's one other thing that he mentions. This is more in chapter 10. And this is the most like, so who knows when he says this? He admits, yeah, this is going to sound shocking, right? And it seems like it can't be quite the right way to put it, but he doesn't know any other way to put it. Namely, that the people, the adherence of the old paradigm and the adherence of the new paradigm work in different worlds. Um, so, um, by which he means uh, they can't compare their observations against each other because they don't have the same observations in, 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 in the same cases. So, like, he has two examples of this. One is, is one of his favorite examples, which is the example of Schaff. Um, 
first being attracted to and then rebounding from something what we would say uh, like an object with a static charge. So like you have, I guess it works something like this. Um, you have something with a big, let's say negative static charge and the chap has a little positive charge. So the chap is attracted to this. But then once the chap sticks to it, um, the you know current flows so that the chap starts to acquire a negative charge. Because you know this again, this is a small negative positive charge, and this is a big negative charge. So like in the end, this is still going to be negative, but this this thing is also going to be negative. So now instead of being attracted to the negative charge, it's repelled by it. And so it rebounds. So Kuhn says, that's how this looks after you have Franklin's paradigm. But for, to a mechanist, you look at the same thing and you see the chaff just bouncing off. Uh, okay. It's a mechanical process. And so, um, like the whole thing that uh, Franklin can explain here, like doesn't even happen in the mechanist universe. <laughs> there is no repulsion, it's just bouncing. Now, I mean, this example is, and he has a number of examples like this. Another example that maybe in some ways is more convincing but has problems is the example of the pendulum. It has problems because as Kuhn says, and I have no reason to doubt this, um, throughout the history of Aristotelianism until the very end when new ideas were already being developed, People just didn't talk about swinging stones, right? Like it wasn't a topic of interest for physicists. I mean, that's already an example of another kind of, maybe of this kind of incommensurability, right? Like what if the paradigm tells you what kind of situations are worth investigating and which are too complicated, too, you know, um, uh, unusual or special or whatever to be worth investigating. So, you know, so the Aristotelians, but Kuhn says what the Aristotelians would say. So, this is, he's doing a little projection beyond his data too here, right? He's saying what the Aristotelians would say in the case of, um, so, like, you know, you have this stone attached to a chain and you release it. So when you release a stone, according to Aristotelians, what should it do? It should move towards the center of the universe. But it's constrained by this chain. Um, so it can't move straight there. So instead, it follows this kind of convoluted path until it finally comes to rest as low as it can. That's the Aristotelian version of this. And, you know, so, right, so this is, so what's happening here, the overall process is that this stone is coming to rest as near to the center of the earth as it can. But because it's, it's this weird situation with this chain and whatever, it moves in a weird way, and it's really complicated. It's not that interesting. <laughs> Whereas Galileo, looking at the same thing, sees a periodic motion. The stone is swinging back and forth, and, um, and it, you know, and it would continue swinging back and forth like that forever, except you know there's some you know there's some friction here or something that slows it down until it finally stops. 
So the, the process we're talking about is completely different. It has different endpoints. Right? This, this process is of something swinging back and forth. This process is of something getting from here to there. Um, so um, like you wouldn't even make the same measurements. Right? Like Galileo is really interested in the period. Aristotelian, there is no period. It does one thing, it starts from here and it gets to there. <laughs> so, um, these examples suggest that, you know, somehow living in different worlds. Is, it's, as Kuhn says, it doesn't seem like the right way to say it, but it does suggest that, yeah, somehow the people on two sides can't, aren't even talking about the same sentence. So they, they don't make the same measurements. Um, uh, so they have no data to compare with each other, basically. But actually, Kuhn also talks about something even stronger, which is, um, and uh, this is even more interesting, I think, which is, so um, this is about the law of fixed proportions in chemistry. So, I mean, this is a little bit complicated, but like in chemistry as we know it, which is basically Daltonian chemistry in this respect, like a chemical um, reaction is a reaction where the atoms um, of the ingredients get sorted to make a new kind of molecule, right? Like, so for example, we mix hydrogen we start with hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules, and we end up with water molecules. And of course, the, this molecule always contains a whole, all the molecules always contain a whole number of, of every type of atom, right? Like there's no molecule that has half a hydrogen atom. So, like, so to get this to happen, there's always going to have, there's always going to be a specific proportion of these ingredients that you need to get this result, right? Like, so in this case, you need to have two hydrogen molecules, one oxygen molecule, and you got two water molecules. That's the only way it'll work, right? I mean, or any multiple of them, obviously, right? So there's going to be four hydrogen. And two oxygen yields uh, for water, you know, and so forth. Um, so, I mean, this means that, like, even when you're dealing not with individual atoms, but with whole flasks full of stuff or whatever, still there has to be a whole number of atoms <laughs> in each one. <laughs> and uh, and this tells you, like, you know. Um, um, that I mean, it doesn't tell you exactly how it's going to work out because for that you have to know the how the weight of a hydrogen atom is related to the weight of an oxygen atom, right? But if you plug that in, so if, like for example, we know that approximately an oxygen atom weighs eight times as much as a hydrogen atom. So like if you have you know one gram of hydrogen then you're gonna need so you're gonna need like um, half as many oxygen molecules but each oxygen molecule weighs eight times as much, so you're going to need like four grams of oxygen, right? And then out of that, you can figure out how many grams of water we're going to get. Um, 
And so, like, to get this reaction to happen, you always have to have four times as much oxygen by weight as you have hydrogen. If you have, let's say, five grams of oxygen, then the reaction won't go through all the way, and you'll have oxygen left over. That's the law of fixed proportions. And if you think of chemical reactions this way, as um, Kuhn says, the law of fixed proportions is basically a tautology, right? Like if you have whole numbers of things and you mix them together, you know, you have to, whatever. I don't know exactly how to put it to make it sound simple, but you can see why like, it's got to be true, right? It's not like something that can be falsified. So, but um, Kuhn says, like, before Daltonian chemistry, first of all, the definition of chemical reaction was different. And they included things like dissolving salt in water as a chemical reaction. Well, you know, you can put a little salt in the water or a lot of salt in the water. <laughs> so uh, there's no fixed proportion there, right? So the and they, they, like, they, they just didn't think of chemical reactions this way for that reason. So Kuhn says that after the Daltonian revolution, the data about the weights of things you needed to combine the reactions shifted. Like, before, there was a lot of observations that showed that there were no fixed proportions for certain reactions. Now, some of those, like I said, got thrown out because after the revolution, they're not considered chemical reactions anymore. They're considered mixture, right? But, but that's not the only case Kuhn says where it happened. There's cases where we agree that it's a chemical reaction. And now, of course, we find a fixed proportion. But before the revolution, they didn't find a fixed proportion. So how can that be? Well, I mean, I don't think Kuhn isn't saying that it's magic, first of all, right? But like somehow changing paradigms made hydrogen and oxygen and water two different things, right? And I don't think he's saying that it's fraud either, although that, I mean, presumably that magic thing doesn't happen, presumably. Fraud thing does happen. You know, or data fudging, right? Like, I think we know now that Kepler fudged his data to make the planets fit on, paths fit on perfect ellipses. And uh, I guess Mendeleev also fudged his genetic data. <laughs> yeah, so whatever. So that kind of thing does happen, but that's, I think, is not what Kuhn is talking about. Right? He says that these were careful observations by some of the best observers. And the, and the pre paradigm ones that, sh that didn't show the fixed proportions, he says some of these were some of the best um, chemists, and some of them were the, among the chemists who were most open to a change like this, but they still they didn't see the fixed proportions until after the change. So, why does this happen then if it's not magic and it's not fraud? So, Kuhn says, this is on page 135, it is hard to make nature fit a paradigm. It's not easy to do these to do these measurements accurately. All kinds of things happen to screw it up. Um, so um, before you have a paradigm that tells you there's something wrong with it, when you get a measurement that doesn't, when you get measurements that don't show a fixed proportion, you say, oh. Because there isn't a fixed proportion. After there's a paradigm, that becomes a puzzle that has to be solved. There must be a fixed proportion. We have to measure it more carefully. <laughs> right? So it's it's a matter like without any kind of fraud or anything, it's just a matter of like um, the new paradigm tells you keep working harder because you've got to get the, a certain kind of result. The old paradigm didn't tell you to do that, so you so you stopped earlier. But again, this means I think now in an even stronger way that the data that, that we want to use to compare the two paradigms to each other are not the same. <laughs> 
Um, now, I mean, does this really amount to saying that we live in different worlds? So, like, I mean, because it, you know, this could just to say it to say more than just they got different measurements in the same experiments or um, they noticed different things when they looked at a, at a stone on a, on a chain. I mean, uh, that, you know, that causes problems for populists, okay? but it doesn't necessarily seem to imply that it's a different world, right? I mean, they still were, and actually Kuhn even kind of introduces some technical terminology for this. He'll say, like, they were still looking at the same thing. But they no longer saw the same thing. Um, right, so like, this is on page 129. Whatever he may then see, the scientist after a revolution is still looking at the same world. Right, or he says, uh, Galileo, looking at the swinging body, saw a pendulum. Um, so that would suggest that, you know, I mean, it's still the same world because they're still looking at the same thing. Um, but I think, uh, who ultimately, this is where the thing about the epistemological paradigm that we've inherited from Descartes breaking down. Kuhn ultimately doesn't think that, the problem is that we don't, he says, have any neutral way of saying what it is that they're all looking at in general. So, um, so although we want to say this, it's hard to make it work. It's anomalous. Um, I have time, it's only two minutes left. I wanted to talk about the duck rabbit again. Because, I mean, the, the, so the duck rabbit, well, I mean, I'll start talking about it now when we finish next time. So that, No draw very big duck rabbit. Right. You, you see the duck and we are all familiar with this, the duck and yeah. right. So like um so like the gestalt switch of the duck rabbit who says it's like what happens in the line All right, all right. It's like what happens in a scientific revolution. In some ways. So, um, one way it's like it is that it's sudden, right? You suddenly see it differently. Um, the other way it happens similar is that it's unstructured. You don't like, you can't do it one part at a time. You can't be given a list of steps to go through to see it the other way. You just have to make the switch. Um, um, but Kuhn says it's not like scientific revolutions in two other important ways. One is that it's not that it's reversible. Right? So like if at first you see the duck, and then you see the rabbit. Then you can go back to seeing the duck. You can't really see them both at once, but uh, but you can switch back and forth. Whereas scientific progress apparently is not reversible. That's I mean that's kind of a prerequisite for calling anything progress that it has to not be reversible. <laughs> so. Um, so scientific progress apparently is not reversible. The other difference is um, that um, 
In this case, um, it's clear what we're looking at when we see the duck and what we're looking at when we see the rabbit. We're looking at these lines on the chalkboard. So, um, I mean, you know, I'm kind of out of time, but I'll, I'll just say this one thing and I'll maybe expand on this next time. Like, it's, you know, we call this example the duck rabbit, but it's what we really should call it the duck picture rabbit picture. There isn't a duck or a rabbit. <laughs> like, if I brought an animal in a cage into the room and, you, and it was hopping around and you said, oh, a rabbit. And then I said, but look, see this as the beak. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, we saw a duck. You didn't know what to say you were looking at, right? A scientific revolution according to Kuhn is like that. <laughs> all right, I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. <laughs>